we go. All right. Okay, so um, we're going to pick up there bottom page five or bottom half of page five. So who do you say that I am? Ultimately, the most important question any of us can answer about Jesus is, who do you say that I am? It is popular to deny in this world, not us, I hope, that Jesus was not, or that Jesus was the Son of God, but to instead hold him up as a wise, revolutionary, spiritual guru. That's common. Um, people that, that are um, Jewish believe that Jesus was a, a great teacher. People that are Muslim will also acknowledge that Jesus was an actual historical figure, but certainly not the Son of God. They would say that Jesus never called himself the Son of God, that his disciples said it of him later, and then invented stories in which they have Jesus claiming such divinity. However, such a view is hopelessly naive because Jesus does say it repeatedly in the Bible. Why did Jesus get nailed to the cross? It wasn't because Jesus taught people to love one another. That's not why he was killed. The ruling authorities didn't crucify Mr. Rogers. The reason I'm making that reference, Mr. Rogers is a pretty nice guy. Right? So if Jesus taught everyone to love one another, I don't think they're like, hey, we can't have that going on. Right? So we need to get rid of this guy. They crucified Jesus because he claimed to be God. Blasphemy. And it infuriated them. Therefore, there's only three answers we can give with intellectual integrity to the question of Jesus' identity. Um, I borrowed this from uh, C.S. Lewis. So this is a, a logical argument. Good for those of you that are type A like me. Um, this helps if you're going to have a conversation with someone and they said, well, maybe Jesus wasn't God. Go, okay, so let's walk it through. Jesus is one of three things. He has to be one of these three. So he is either, number one, Jesus is a liar. Now, don't, don't be offended by me. I'm, I'm forming an argument. I'm not claiming that he is. Okay, so he is one of three things. He's either a liar, which means, in other words, he wasn't who he said he was and he knew it. Right, so he said I'm the son of God, but he knew I wasn't. So, however, does the evidence of his life indicate that he was a liar? So what liar, when faced with a slow, torturous death, that's crucifixion, maintains a lie? He drops the pretense, seeks to be spared, which is all Jesus would have had to do when he was before Pilate. Pilate says, tell me you're not the king of the Jews, and I'll let you go. And Jesus says, can't do it, right? I am what I am. Okay? And however, Jesus willingly goes to the cross because he is who he says he is. If, if you lie, you're trying to gain an advantage. Almost every time you lie, you're trying to gain an advantage. If Jesus lied, if he was just a man, okay, I'm not claiming that he's the son of God, if this is where we would hold that he's a liar, what liar would say, I'm willing to die for the lie, but I won't benefit from it at all afterwards? I'll just die. And you're like, well then don't lie. That just doesn't seem to make sense. I'm a lie and lose any advantage I have. So it doesn't seem to be holding a lot of water that he was a liar. So what about number two? Jesus is a lunatic. In other words, he wasn't who he says he was, but he didn't know it. He could have claimed that he was, in our modern day, Napoleon. Right? I'm just somebody who I'm not. However, does the evidence of his life indicate that he was mentally unstable. He demonstrates composure under the most intense emotional conditions. He was often, often in the public eye. You would have thought if he snapped that that would have been something that people would have told him. I remember the one time that he started barking like a dog. I remember the one time that he started, you know, clucking like a chicken. And I, I don't mean to be irreverent, but the point is, is if he had times where mentally there were breaks, it would have been obvious. Think of when he was praying in Gethsemane, where it said that he was praying with such um, uh, 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 some, such uh, fervor that it, it actually blood, uh, like drops of sweat from his body. That's a pretty intense time for you to be mentally unbalanced and not break, okay? So my point is, is if he is not a liar and not a lunatic, which means there's no evidence to support that, the third option is Jesus is the Lord. So it's an alliteration, LLL, -L -L, liar, lunatic, Lord. So in other words, he is who he said he was. Again, is there evidence? Because I'm not just going to say he's the Lord because it's the best of the three options. Okay, that's just eliminating the other two. That's like, you know, when my wife would go through the leftovers in the fridge. Okay, you want this thing that's been in here for a week and a half? You want with this thing because I can't identify it? Or would you like this? And you're like, well, the third option seems like the only good one. Doesn't matter what it is. Okay. So, again, is there evidence from his life to indicate that he is God in the flesh? Well, there were the miracles, okay? 
Really hard to argue with miracles. Almost every miracle of Jesus was done publicly, which means that he was always scrutinized. People could watch it. He often took his disciples in with him, even when he went in to heal the little girl from death. Take three disciples and her parents with him so they can tell the story, not kind of go in there, nobody knows what's going on, and ta-da, right, here she is, or whatever. Then there's the prophecies fulfilled by Jesus, right? The things that were spoken of him long ago, like where he'd be born in Bethlehem, that he would be, you know, born of a virgin. I don't know how you fulfill that prophecy as, a, as an embryo. Okay, um, and, and all the other things that, you know, who his family would be and stuff like that. These are things that you couldn't manipulate yourself. Then there's the resurrection. That's a pesky thing, right? Uh, not only did Jesus, not only was he raised, but he appeared to hundreds of people afterwards. Hundreds. Then there was the cover-up story from the Roman soldiers, right? They're, they're kind of like going, um, he's gone. What do you mean he's gone? We posted you guys right outside, sealed the, the rock with wax, put the seal on it. You know, how can he be gone? The disciples, the fishermen came and overpowered you and took the body. Um, we'll just tell them that they stole him. That's a pretty lame story, right? But the reason you have to come up with a cover-up story is because he wasn't stolen, right? He walked out and, uh, and, and was, vis uh, was visually seen and heard. Um, for weeks afterwards. If Jesus is who he says he is, this has profound implications. It means everything, all history, all lives, all things really do revolve around him and are subject to him. So the question still is, who do you say that he is? Okay, so good little, um, good little uh, uh, alliteration to talk about who Jesus is. Liar, lunatic, Lord. And, and just walk them through it. Somebody says, I don't, I don't believe that Jesus is God. And you're like, okay. So he's one of three things. He's either a liar, he was a lunatic, or he is the Lord. Walk through each one. Does it show that he's a liar? Well, yeah, he lied. Okay. Would, would you, if you were a liar, continue to go through a slow, torturous death knowing that all you had to go, hey, I was just kidding. I'm not the Messiah. I give it in, right? And I'm just a regular guy. And they're like, well, you can go free then. Anybody would do that, right? All right. So God the Father, God the Son, now God the Holy Spirit, page seven. Um, who is God the Holy Spirit? God the Holy Spirit is the mysterious, uh, the mysterious third member uh, of the Trinity. So the Holy Spirit is co-equal with the Father and the Son. He is no lesser God. Uh, when we baptize someone, uh, Matthew 28, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we don't go Father and a little bit the Son and just a tiny little bit the Spirit. Okay, Each one the same. We say it that way. Two, the Holy Spirit brings us to faith in Jesus. One of his jobs, right, in a sense, is to bring us to faith. 1 Corinthians 12, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. I had a friend I used to ride motorcycles with um, in uh, St. Louis, and I had a group of us that used to ride out on uh, Friday mornings, go to breakfast together. Uh, his name was Troy. Troy was an atheist. Uh, he told me that often, and uh, he was a mail carrier, but I liked him. Um, not, not because he was a mail carrier. I just liked him because he rode motorcycles. Uh, but I liked him because he was about 6'8 and almost 300 pounds. Uh, he was in a motorcycle club, which means motorcycle gang. That's code for that. And, uh, and his uh, code name, uh, his gang name was One Ton uh, and, and on his big old bike. But he liked me. And so I always liked hanging out with Troy. So we'd go into some place for breakfast. He always wanted to sit by me. And uh, so what I would do whenever we got together, there's like 10, 12 of us that would come together. Some people from my church, some people that were just friends of people. About half of us were Christians. That was kind of the whole point of getting together and riding bikes to just kind of share a little bit as we could. Troy didn't want anything to do with my faith at all. Told me that often. And I said, well, here's what we're going to do. Every time we sit down for breakfast, I'm going to pray for the food before it goes. If you don't like that, sit and shut up and just wait till we're done. Okay? I can say that to Troy because he liked me. Otherwise, I would have been saying that from across the room. And so um, Troy could say the words, Jesus is Lord. But he wouldn't mean it. That's what that verse is all about. An atheist could say those words. They're not tongue-tied. It's not impossible for an unbeliever to say, Jesus is Lord. So when it says, no one can say Jesus is Lord by, except by the Holy Spirit, it's saying, if you're a believer, you could say those words and you go, Jesus is in charge. Jesus is the authority. Jesus is my leader. You can say it because faith shows you what that means. An atheist could say it. It just doesn't make any difference. It's just three words in the English language they've linked together. That's what it says. Number three, the Holy Spirit enables us to experience 
the blessings of salvation and a personal relationship with God. First Corinthians 2, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. So there are things of God that the Holy Spirit is the one flipping the switch. When that little light bulb goes on, he's like, you want to understand it? I'll do it. There it is. And you go, oh. So every once in a while, I hope it happens in church. Maybe it's during a sermon. Maybe during a Bible class. Maybe in this class. A light bulb moment, right? You kind of go, aha, that's the Holy Spirit. Simple as that. If you have an aha moment, that's the Holy Spirit. Make it easy. Number four, the Holy Spirit enables us to live godly lives. Godly lives, God-honoring lives. Philippians 2, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So when you do something that God is directing, that God is blessed by, it is the Holy Spirit doing that in you. It's not you. You and I are sinful. We can't do anything good, but God can do good through us. Okay. Number five, the Holy Spirit gives us spiritual gifts to use to the benefit of others in his name. Um, and here it calls it in Paul, it says manifestations of the Spirit uh, given to people. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, next page, page eight, the Holy Trinity. So it is a mystery of God's nature, and it is a deep one. No human ever fully understand it, including your pastor. Yet the Bible does teach us enough to know that God is three distinct persons while being only one God. So he is three persons but one God. Try unity, or what we call trinity. We shorten it. And so that diagram is trying its best to describe it. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. However, all of them are God. So that one moment um, where Jesus was standing in the Jordan and John the Baptist was baptizing him, the clouds open up, the Father speaks down, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, and a dove descends on him with the Holy Spirit in that form down on him. Right there, you see all three persons of the Trinity, and yet right there is God. It's not three gods, it's God. And so Jesus is completely God when he's Jesus. But it doesn't mean that the Father and the Spirit aren't also God at the same time. But they're not different gods. Okay, so that, that's the hard thing for us to kind of wrap our heads around. So the Bible speaks both ways. Sometimes it says God is one and God is three. It's just saying, well, it's interchangeable. So Deuteronomy, hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Or Matthew, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three, okay? Three in one, one in three. And if you're wrestling with that, welcome, all right? That's, that's where we should be. All right, so leaving off the Trinity, um, if you have some more questions about that, please shoot me a note. I'd be glad to talk you through that uh, as best we can. But let's talk about the sacraments. Um, what is a sacrament? Three things uh, it is. We kind of define it this way. Uh, it's something that's commanded by God in the Bible. He says, do this. It's connected to a physical object of some sort. So he lets us be involved. That's why it's a physical object. And through which God says, I deliver forgiveness. So that's that thing of grace, again, from yes last week. So we often call them means of grace, a mechanism by which grace is delivered. It's a means, okay? Uh, it's also a visible expression of the gospel. It's something you and I can see and experience that God says, this is how I love you. And it's another way for the gospel, the big picture of grace, to become mine. So I'm involved. Um, we believe, based on that defini those definitions, that there are two sacraments uh, outlined in the Bible. There's baptism. Baptism is commanded by God. Go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing. There's the command. Uh, it's connected to uh, a physical element, that being water. Um, and God promises forgiveness of sins. Be baptized and receive forgiveness of sins. That's what fits um, the sacrament. Lord's Supper, commanded by God, take and eat, take and drink. Those are commands connected to bread and wine, the physical elements, and God's promise of forgiveness is delivered as well. So why do other church bodies have more sacraments than baptism and the supper? For example, Catholics, they have seven sacraments, right? Now, the reason that they have more sacraments than, for instance, we as Protestants uh, is because they have a different definition of what a sacrament is. That's all it is. It's apples and oranges. 
Um, it's not wrong to have more than one. They, they would say that uh, marriage is a sacrament, but that doesn't fit that criteria at all. It's not something that God commands. It doesn't command marriage. Um, I'm not sure if you consider your spouse a physical element that's included. Um, and I don't think marriage delivers forgiveness. You got to practice it a lot, uh, but I don't think it delivers it when you get married, okay? Um, Martin Luther would say the act of confession is pretty close to a sacrament. The only thing that's missing in, in confession is a physical element, right? Because God does command it, forgive one another, right? And, and it, obviously forgiveness does offer forgiveness. Um, the difference is it doesn't have a physical element. We don't have a, something that we manipulate or hold or do and so forth, but it's kind of on the fence. Baptism then. So let's talk about that. I think that's the easier of the two sacraments. So some places in the Bible that tells us, Matthew 28, there it is, the command, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Here new believers and devoted followers are made by baptizing and teaching. In baptism, we are marked with the name of God. That's kind of an interesting idea. Um, all of us uh, probably have a birth certificate. And uh, I always think of it this way, when a person is baptized, uh, it's like your birth certificate is amended. Also, child of God now. And, and just that uniqueness of what's added to it. Um, John 3, 1 to 6. Uh, there's a man named Nicodemus who was a Pharisee. Pharisees were often at odds with Jesus. But this particular man, Nicodemus, uh, obviously heard things that Jesus said and did and, and so forth. And then uh, was curious. In fact, so much so, Nicodemus, after Jesus was dead, um, from the crucifixion came uh, with Joseph of Arimathea to help anoint the body. So obviously Nicodemus had become a believer somewhere along the line. So he comes to Jesus uh, late at night. Obviously he was scared of uh, being seen as a Pharisee going and talking to Jesus. But he comes and asks him and he says, um, and Jesus tells him, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. That's the phrase. And so Nicodemus naturally as a guy kind of goes, how can a man be born again when he's old? Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Thanks for that image, right? But what he's basically saying is, that, are you claiming that we have to be born a second time? You're like, how is that possible, right? And then Jesus is like, no, right? But it is, it is an image of being born again. He says, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit is something unique. So, the bullet points at the bottom. Through baptism, we are born again, not of our body, but of our spirit. This happens not because of the water, but because of the Holy Spirit. Spirit does it. However, God has chosen that this new birth happens with water by the Holy Spirit. So um, I don't mean to rattle your cages on this, but the water that we use for baptism comes out of the tap. There is not a special baptism fountain that we have. Right? It's not a, a, you've got to drill down deep enough to get the baptism water. Because if it were, and, I, and this is why I want to explain it this way, if it were, then the water is special along with the Word of God. So you need special water and the Word of God in order for a person to be brought into the kingdom of God. You see the problem with that? The water is magical. And that's a terrible word to use in a sacrament. It's not magic at all. But it's the Word of God that does it all. I can tell you that it's not even me who makes the baptism special. Anyone can baptize, right? In an emergency, you can baptize anyone, okay? Um, now, I want you to know it's really important that they're kind of willing, right? It's not like I'm going to go to the mall with a super soaker and a bullhorn and just start saving people as I walk down the hall, you know? Um, that's not how it works. Yeah, <laughs> I'd be running away as I was doing it, you know? But the point is, is that the, the act of baptism is something that is, it's 100% God doing it. it. It is not you and I like somehow the pastor makes it or validates it. Now, the reason I do it in church is because I'm the shepherd. And, and we just do things in good order that way, right? But it, it doesn't, you know, it's not like one day someone's going to get to the pearly gates and, and kind of go, you know, why should I let you into my heaven? Well, Pastor Eric baptized me. Oh, well, come right in. That's, that matters. And it's like... No, I believe in Jesus and that's it. Acts 2, it says this, Therefore, I'll let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart, said to Peter and other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? 
Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the presence of the Spirit. It's not the gift from the Holy Spirit. The gift is the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. The promise is for you and your children. So through baptism, we receive from God the forgiveness of our sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise of gifts from God through baptism is for adults and children. We'll talk about the children, babies thing in a second. Galatians 3, it says, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, for all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. So through baptism, we're officially adopted into the family of God. Through baptism, we are covered in the grace and forgiveness of Jesus. Which is, by the way, uh, why we often dress in white for baptism, especially children, right? Adults, we don't often do that, although you can baptize adults. We baptize anybody. Um, it's just a willingness. But that's the reason that we do that. I remember once I was baptizing a little baby in uh, St. Louis at my church uh, in Webster Gardens. And uh, I picked up the baby and I took it over to the font and mom and dad are there and grandparents were there and, and the whole family's kind of gathered around. And I started saying, I said, now this baby uh, needs to be baptized because I said, this baby is sinful. And the grandmother was right here and she's really close to my mic. And she was, oh no. <laughs> There was that really awkward moment where the whole congregation just kind of goes, we all heard that. Now what are you going to do? And I, and I just kind of said, actually, this little baby is sinful. Not because of what it does or what it says and so forth, but because it's human, right? It, it, is, it was conceived in sin, right? That's what David says in the Psalms. And so what we recognize is even though we cover it in white, so I can tell you guys uh, as a pastor, we often wear a, a robe called an alb, and, and it's white, right? And, and that is, is for the purpose of to, to recognize that we are conveying to you all God's grace. It does not mean I am sinless, okay? Um, in fact, uh, one of the great examples, I don't wear a clerical shirt. I know some pastors do, priests do in, in the Catholic Church a lot. That's the black shirt with the white collar. Um, but what I'm fascinated by is, is what that is. The reason the black shirt is to recognize our sinfulness, but the white that's right up here is when I speak the word of God, it is pure because it's not my word. So the white is when I speak it, you can trust the word. Don't trust the guy, right? Because I'm broken and black, right, with sin. But the white is actually when you speak the word of God, it's the word of God. Now, you pervert that, you're going to have to take it up with him, okay? But the point is, is so we, we celebrate that with Covered a person. So when a, when a, a young kid, um, young young kid, young young person, um, eighth grade or so, is confirmed, they go through confirmation or catechism in the uh, Catholic Church. They often put a white gown on. Same thing, celebrating the gift of God's grace to you. That's what it symbolizes. It's just a symbol, right? It's it's not that somehow you are unsinning, you know, unsinful or so forth. All right. The summary then for us, what happens to us in baptism? Number one, the name of God is placed on us. We talked about that. You're baptized in the name of. Names are personal, right? Um, you and I spend a lot of time wrestling about what to name our kids. Um, I remember going through that with the baby book, uh, the baby name book. Boy, I tell you what, Chrissy, I think um, being a teacher puts an extra burden on that. My wife and I, we were both teachers um, early on in our adult career. And uh, we'd like, well, let's name him Josh. I like Joshua. And she's like, oh no, remember that student we had? And it, okay, not Joshua. How about Michael? I like Michael's a good name. No, remember that one kid? He was always been, okay. Um, how about, uh, you know, and we just kind of go, boy, the students just wreck names, you know, for us. And uh, so anyhow, we, we lament over those things. But when you are baptized in the name of God, that's a connection. You're part of the family. Number two, the spirit of God is placed in us. That's one of the things that God promises us is that the Holy Spirit will dwell within you. And, and with that comes all the benefits, faith, being able to do godly things, being able to, to understand godly things. And number three, the forgiveness of God is spread over us. Again, forgiveness is promised. That's the whole point of it being a sacrament, okay? So what are the implications then of being baptized? Well, it's the power, Martin Luther would say, for daily living. In fact, he encourages us, think or remember your baptism every day. Let me tell you something about your pastor more than you wanted to know. 
Um, every morning I pray in the shower. Now, one of the things that kicks that off is when I stand under the water, um, I'm reminded of my baptism. Plain and simple. It's just that water rolls over and I'm just kind of going, today, God, I am baptized. I'm not baptized again. I, there's no need to baptize if God did his work once. You don't have to keep doing it. But it's a reminder, that aha moment. Um, and then praying just seems like a good thing to do. I'm about as exposed to God as I'm going to be in that circumstance. And so I'm just like going, God, here's what's on my mind. And, uh, and I've showered enough in my life. I don't have to think about what I'm doing too often, right? So it's kind of on autopilot. Number one, <clears throat> we are God's possession. Therefore, we have God's protection. We are God's possession. Therefore, we have God's protection. We are his. So there's a... There's an implication. So does that mean that nothing bad will ever happen to us? <laughs> Romans 8 says, And we know that in all things God works for good of those who love him who have been called according to his purposes. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of God. Which means even the struggles that we have is part of God's training and transformation in our lives. Uh, now God does absolutely give good things. He blesses us. Um, he helps, he rescues us from problems and things like that. But he also understands, just like if you had kids or remember when you were a kid, um, that sometimes those in authority over you allow things or even do things to you to improve you. And those things are often hard, right? And so God allows hard things sometimes to enter into our lives to improve us, to strengthen us. Because, see, here's what we can't get away from. God's ultimate goal for all of us is heaven. And God will allow us to go through anything necessary to get us there. Which means if Jesus is the way and you are looking elsewhere, God may allow something to happen to drop you to your knees so that you look back at Jesus. Right? Now, I can tell you, life would be a whole lot easier if we just looked at Jesus all the time. Right? But instead, God says, when you get lost, I'm going to bring you back. And sometimes I'd bring you back kicking and screaming. Right? But I love you enough to do that. I don't just sit there and go, well, you're lost. Okay, All right. Um, so what is the good which God is working all things toward for us? Is it to make us happy? To give us an easy life? No hassles or no trouble? Of course not. None of that's true for us. The good is our being conformed. The good is our being conformed or transformed to the spiritual or character likeness of Jesus. We are to follow and be like him as best we can. So number two, we can always know whose we are and where we belong no matter where we end up. When you're baptized, that doesn't go away, right? The prodigal son, if you guys know that story, it's often called the lost son. Um, the prodigal son rebels against his father, goes to a faraway land, um, parties up, spends all his money, uh, and then there's a great famine and he suffers. And then one day while he's feeding the pigs, he says, there's people that work for my dad that are better off than I am. And I'm going to go back. Do you know why he can go back? Because he's still his father's son. That didn't change. Now, was he disobedient? Did he dishonor his dad? Absolutely. When we sin and rebel against God, do we dishonor God? Absolutely. But if you are a child of God, that does not go away. Now, you can throw it away. You can reject what comes with it. But God does not say, I'm done with you. That's enough. Ever. Okay? So why must we baptize babies too? Lutherans are somewhat unique in this. Uh, as far as most Protestant faiths, um, for, for example, our Baptist brothers and sisters, they practice, um, I think almost exclusively, um, uh, all Baptist church uh, churches, uh, that you have to be of a certain age of understanding in order to be baptized. Kind of what we would do for uh, confirmation when you stand up and go, this is my faith. The difference is, even though I, I, I admire that and I appreciate that, there is nothing in the Bible about it. They've just simply decided that this is necessary in order for you to be baptized. You have to understand it. Um, and that is not something that the Bible says before you will be baptized, you have to understand it. It says because faith comes with baptism. So if I baptize a baby, and I've done quite a few, I've done Augie, the last one was for you guys, uh, your son, and, and obviously your daughter before that. Um, when that little boy was baptized, and little Augie, um, he received the gift of the Holy Spirit. God promises us in grace. And at that point, he has faith. And, and I can tell you, Augie couldn't talk. 
He could squirm, he could coo, and he could make lots of noises and make other things. Uh, but it, it, nothing else. Couldn't confess his sins. Now, I don't mean to be at all trite about this, but if Augie were to die thereafter, he would go to heaven. 100%. Why? Because he had faith. Doesn't have to profess it out loud. Just have to have faith. And he had it. That's why one of the main reasons we baptize babies. There is a, there is a, a, a conviction that says no matter what, after that baptism, they're saved. Now, you're saved as you get older and your brain starts to work and your heart starts to work and so forth. You can turn your back on it. Up until that point, we're kind of telling these little babies, you're like, you're doing this. Right? We train them up and, and so forth. But there does come a time, and we kind of have it as confirmation, where they stand up and go, this is now my faith. I'm responsible for this. It's mine. So if I walk away from it, one day I stand before God and God goes, who do you say Jesus is? You're like, I reject him. That's on you. Okay? Little Augie can't reject God now. Right? Just part and parcel with him. Right? So this is why God tells us to. To baptize babies, it says go and make disciples of all nations. Doesn't say all adults. All people are born sinful by nature and in need of salvation. Surely I was sinful at birth. Sinful, actually, from the time my mother conceived me. Letter C, it says the example of Old Testament circumcision for boys, obviously, uh, at eight days old. Circumcision marked a child as God's child. That's how Jews were separated from all other ethnic groups by circumcision. God marked them or had them marked, that was his command. God did not wait for the child to grow up to claim him. He said, I'm claiming you at eight days old. Uh, he claimed the child and commanded the parents to then raise the child up knowing their heavenly father, which is what we say to parents, right? Are you going to raise this child up in the way of the church and teach them in church and pray and worship God and so forth? And then we baptize with the ex expectation that you're gonna continue this start of this journey as it goes along. If we baptize an adult, we flip-flop it. Will you learn? Will you pursue God? Do you want to do this? Then we'll baptize you because you're committing that, you know, I'm old enough to be able to say, I'll do this. Little baby can't do that. In fact, what they usually do is squirm when you put them up there, right? Not, what are you doing, right? I, I don't know. Well, it's for your own good, right? You're going to have to do this. Um, letter D, babies can receive a blessing whether they ask for it or not. Uh, Luke 18, people were bringing babies to Jesus to have him touch them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked him, but Jesus called the children to him and said, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. When, when children come up to communion, for example, the other sacrament, and I bless them, they don't have to understand what I'm saying, right? They can receive a blessing without understanding. That's God doing the work. You don't get a blessing kind of going, I understand what you're doing. Now it's good for me. Instead, you're just kind of like, here it is. And they're just like, hey, thanks. Babies can have faith even if they cannot yet express it on their own because faith comes from God, not us. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust even at my mother's breast, David said in Psalm 22. Okay. So uh, we'll take another swing at this. Lord's Supper. Let's, I can get this done in 20 minutes. Let's see. All right. This one's challenging a little bit because there's a little difference between baptism and the Lord's Supper as far as how it's laid out when we participate in it. Um, I can tell you, I look at it this way. Baptism for me is an emergency. It's an, well, I'll say an urgency, not an emergency. It's an urgency. Lord's Supper is not, okay? So if somebody says, I, I want to be baptized, I'm probably not going to do much to get in the way of that. Kind of, let's do that, absolutely. Somebody says, I want to take the Lord's Supper. I got to take it right now. Tell me why right now, right? Because they're both deliverers of grace, and, and so forth. So if somebody comes to me and says, well, I'm not too sure I agree with this or I believe the same and say, that's okay. It's not an emergency to take the Lord's Supper. I will tell you if you're not baptized and God calls you to baptize, I'd like to know why you say no, right? Now, at the same time, let me say this, be clear. You're not saved because you're baptized. You're going to baptize because we're obedient, right? Because the thief on the cross next to Jesus Right? And he said, you know, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus didn't say, I'm sorry, you got to get down off the cross, get baptized first. Right? And then you can come to heaven. He says, what saves you is faith. We baptize out of obedience because God says, go and make disciples, baptizing them. Because baptizing, there are blessings that come with that. But if, if a baby dies before it's baptized, God doesn't sit there and just, God is still a good God. 
right? And, and, uh, and so forth. But I can tell you, it gives you peace of mind and trust. When we are baptized and say, you receive the gift of faith, you receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit, and there's absolute 100% conviction and confidence um, that they'd be in heaven, all right? Lord's Supper, what's the Bible teach? Matthew 26, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, offered it, saying to them, drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. What you're seeing is why it's a sacrament. There's the command, take and eat, take and drink. It, it refers to physical elements, bread and wine, and it offers forgiveness of sin. So that's why it's considered a sacrament. That's why it's underlined there. First Corinthians kind of reiterates um, its participation uh, in both the body and blood of Christ, his sacrifice. So he delivers grace to us. Um, I say that every Sunday. Uh, it's why I say it. Uh, it is not just simply a reminder or uh, a reference to what Jesus has done. He comes to us in this meal. That's what makes it miraculous. So the summary is this. The importance of the word is, this is where we as Lutherans, and I don't mean to say this pridefully, this is where we as Lutherans differ from most other Protestant religions, other Christian churches, Baptist, Presbyterian, um, Catholic, we're going to talk about is this. The biblical view of the word is. So when Jesus says, take and eat, this is my body, take and drink, this is my blood, that word is, is the word, is the Greek word for is, and it's the most simple verb of them all. So the biblical view is simply means is. It's no more complicated than that. Is means is. It, it's not symbolic. It doesn't mean it changes. And what we end up doing as people is we breathe all sorts of complication into it. Jesus was sitting at the upper room, Lord's Supper, tearing off a piece of bread, hands it to the disciple next to him and says, take and eat, this is my body. And they must have looked at it and go, looks like bread. It smells like bread, tastes like bread, tore like bread. Jesus is right there. Um, I don't understand this. And yet the Son of God just told you, take and eat, this is my body. There's the miracle right? <laughs> the same way that Jesus is 100% physical man, at the same time he is 100% divine God. That bread is both. And that's the miracle and the cup the same way. I'll talk you through that a little bit more. We can't explain how Jesus is present with his body and blood, just that he is. And we can say that because he says so. That's what we come back to. If somebody says, well, I don't understand how it is. Okay. Right? I'll, I'll walk you through as far as it is, but you can go ahead and walk through the Trinity the same way and be able to say, I don't understand how it's three in one. Okay, understand that God is more learned than you and he understands things differently and so forth. Now the Catholic view, top of the next page, is transubstantiation, big fancy word. Trans means to change. Substantiation comes from the word substance. It means the substance is changed. So in the, in the Catholic Mass, their worship liturgies often, at least in a traditional Catholic sense, would be in Latin. And they speak these words where they believe that the bread actually changes into flesh, right? And the wine changes into blood. Now, um, I have a great dear deal of reverence for our, our Catholic brothers and sisters because they often have such a high opinion uh, of God. Okay, the danger here is it's not what God said. Even, even, a, even a high lofty view of God is not okay if it's not what God said. Okay, it, it's kind of like what Eve said uh, in the garden when Satan in the form of a serpent said, uh, what did God tell you about this fruit? She said, we're not to eat it. We're not even supposed to touch it. God said nothing about touching it. Eve elevated, it's like, we're not even supposed to touch it. And, and right away, I got to believe if a serpent could smile, he would have smiled right then, kind of go, you don't know what God said, right? This is going to be easier than I thought because we're twisting God's word. Even if you elevate it, it's twisting, okay? Take it for what God says. The Reformed view, however, pretty much all the rest of the Protestant faith would claim this, the finite cannot bear the infinite. So what that means is finite means things with boundaries, limits. So a wafer of bread if you've taken communion or seen communion at a church and so forth here or anywhere, you understand that that bread has boundaries, okay? And so you're like, that finite 
cannot contain an infinite God. Right? So God cannot be restricted by that. Therefore, the supper can only be symbolic. He can't actually be his flesh and his blood or represent his body and blood. But Colossians says, for in Christ, this Jewish man, all the fullness of the deity of Godness lives in bodily form. So if Jesus can do that, he can do the supper. So if all of God's deity can be in the body of Jesus of Nazareth, and you're like, how can all of the divinity of God be in a human form? Well, it can do that in a wafer. It can do it in a cup of wine. Do it in the Bible. The Bible is a book, and yet it is the very voice of God, right? So the Lord's Supper is not a placebo. It's not something to stand in for something. It matters. So what happens in the Lord's Supper? Letter A, Jesus locates himself for us. He comes to us there, right? like the burning bush I told you about. God located himself in the burning bush. He comes to where we are. Letter B, we receive the forgiveness of sins. That's promised in the sacrament. Notice who is gathered around Jesus that night in the upper room when he institutes the supper. Peter, who says, I'd surely die than deny you. And just in a few hours, he denies him three times. And yet he gave him this gift of the Lord's Supper, knowing that he would deny him. Uh, the supper is for sinners. So if you are one, come. Now, it isn't for blatant sinners. And if you notice, in every service, we always do one particular thing before communion. And that's confession. Always. We'll never do confession after the sacrament. We'll always do it beforehand. It's like, deal with your sin and then come and enjoy the blessings of being a redeemed, forgiven believer and receive the blessing of God. Right? It's not to go up there and, and kind of go, I'm going to receive this meal and uh, I'm doing and living in a way that is ungodly and, and so forth. And I do not care. I'm going to keep doing it and, and so forth. Then God would say, don't take communion. Then. Right. Because it's you're not actually wanting my grace. If you wanted my grace, you'd repent. Right. If, if you want to receive the blessing, now you're mocking it. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we are invited to fellowship or the word is commune at his table, right? That's why we call it communion, by the way. That's one of the words for it. It means that we're all together. So technically you couldn't commune by yourself, even though you could take the Lord's Supper by yourself, but commune would be kind of an oxymoron. In biblical times, to eat at someone's table was to announce a desire to be friends with them, to be in community with them. This is why Jesus always got in trouble with the authorities because he ate at the table with sinners. All right. So let's deal with some of the sticky stuff of this sacrament. Likewise, Jesus reaches out to us in grace and forgiveness, invites us to accept his friendship by eating at his table, hence the term communion. Letter D, we're all joined together as one body, right? So we are the body of Christ as we partake of the Lord's Supper. We dare not look down on the others that Jesus has invited to his table, right? If you know details uh, about the other people that come up for communion, then praise God they're up there, right? Because this is where you receive God's grace, right? Instead of walking up there and kind of going, okay, I'm waiting my turn. What is she doing up here, right? I know what she's up to. And, and this is, uh, boy, you should, you got a lot of gall being up here at the sacrament. It's like complaining that someone in the waiting room at the hospital is sick, right? You'd be like going, it's probably a good place to be if you're sick, Right? Man, what are you doing in this waiting room with a broken arm? Oh, it's ridiculous. You shouldn't be here. This is only where the well people gather. Like, what a silly reason, okay? Understand, you come up there. That's for you. Letter E, there is a responsibility. This is where it's different from baptism. There is a responsibility of faith that comes along with the privilege of receiving this supper, which is interesting. The other sacrament, baptism, gives faith, delivers faith. So they, they go hand in hand. Baptism delivers faith, and that's why it's only done once. Communion is done over and over again once you come to faith and can understand this about faith. 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I passed on to you, Paul says. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord, this is Lord's Supper, in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. And a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. So some key things, and I'm going to talk about this 
uh, and this is the sticky part for us. Whoever eats and drinks in an unworthy manner, we'll talk about that, ought to examine himself or herself. And anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord, um, if you had the old King James Version, eats and drinks to his own damnation. Sounds heavy-handed. Um, so what we call this, let me give you this fill-in since that's the last one there. In order to eat and drink in a worthy manner, we are to examine ourselves for what? It's this, a recognition. A recognition of the presence of the Lord. This happens through simply believing that what Jesus has said is true. So let me explain what it is, uh, and then, then we'll, we'll kind of finish it up. So in the Lutheran church, we'll often refer to it this way. That communion, we practice, the way we practice this sacrament is either, and they're both referring to the same thing, close communion or closed communion. And they are referring to similar things. So close communion means everyone who comes forward to receive the sacrament believes the same. We believe that it is the body and blood of Jesus and he delivers his grace and forgiveness once again. We are all close in our understanding, okay? Close is only those people who believe that it is the body and blood of Jesus come forward to receive the meal. It is closed if you're not, okay? Now, that seems very legalistic and heavy-handed for people. Let me explain what's important about this. So, if, for instance, let me say that uh, Allison has a friend that she brings to church with her um, this next Sunday, and your friend is a Buddhist, okay? Not an orange robe wearing Buddhist, but a Buddhist. And, uh, and, and, and I announce uh, the Lord's Supper and so forth, and your friend says, I want to go up there and take it, right? And, uh, and you don't say anything. And, and, they, uh, and they come forward. Now, I want you to know, here's the amazing thing about God. So when your Buddhist friend comes up, kneels at the rail and so forth, when I deliver the wafer, the host, the bread, they are receiving the body of Christ, okay? Because the person doesn't make it the bread or the host, right? It doesn't make it the body of Christ. The body of Christ just comes. He promises that, okay? So your Buddhist friend would receive the body of Christ, but it wouldn't bless them. It's no good for them because they don't believe as a Buddhist that Jesus is the son of God, lived, suffered, died, rose again for the forgiveness of our sins. So now by my giving it to them, for one, very irresponsible of me, okay? And it actually harms their faith. Because now I have minimized this meal instead of saying there's something really great that this guy Jesus has done for you. And I want you to understand it. And my giving you this bread doesn't help you understand it. I want you to understand it first. If you understand it, now this is a blessing. So you understand that by making this meal closed, it's actually a compassionate thing, not a legalistic thing. And that's the problem. Often we see it as a very legalistic of, of you know, you're just being mean. I've been here, I've, friendly people around me, uh, the sermon was decent, um, I enjoyed the music and so forth, but then comes this time where everybody gets up around me and goes up there and I'm left over here like a social pariah and I can't go everywhere and, and I'm never coming back again. It's one of the reasons why you hear me very often, um, almost every single Sunday, invite people to come forward, right? And, and yet, if you hear the words that I'm expressing, it's kind of like, this is what we believe here, that his body and blood comes to us and so forth, and you receive that grace. If you share that belief, that's really the expectation of faith. Come up here and receive the blessing, okay? Now, if you have a different set of beliefs or still have questions about it, or maybe from a church that doesn't have those beliefs, then come up and get a blessing. God loves you no matter what. And again, there is not an urgency to receive the sacrament. This is not make or break you get into heaven, right? You can make it to heaven without ever taking the Lord's Supper. It is not a requirement. But if you are a practicing believer, God says, this will be an encouragement to you. Every time we hear it, it's an encouragement. It strengthens you. In fact, I say, Jesus Christ has indeed met you here. Go in that peace and joy. Amen. I mean, it's a blessing every time. But it is not a requirement. And so, when we practice that, and so I, I grew up in the Lutheran church, and I remember those times are like, if you're a member of our church, come up. But if you're not, we're going to ask you to please stay seated. And, and you're like, so who might be back there stayed, staying seated? Not members of Lutheran churches, right? Outsiders, people that are visitors, people that were coming to check it out, people that are just curious about Jesus. 
And, and I don't think um, that's a great message to them. And yet I don't want to minimize it by just simply kind of going, hey, y'all come because it doesn't really matter. Right. In fact, we're going to have just Ritz crackers and Kool-Aid because those wafers are not very tasty. Right. So like we're going to you see how we minimize what Jesus has done. We don't want to do that. We want to say this is really great and really important. And I really want you to benefit from it. So Allison's friend, the Buddhist, would receive the body and blood of Jesus, but it would not be beneficial. It'd be effective, we'd say, because they, they'd actually receive it. Just wouldn't do any good. Right? It's, it's like me giving someone a Bible in a language they don't understand. It's still God's word, but if it can't get to you and get into you, it's not any good. All right? Questions on that? Well, the Lord says do this as often as you can. Um, it, it says often. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, that leaves it up to us. Yeah, it leaves it up to us. So you, you are to do the Lord, to practice it regularly. Right? We happen to at faith every Sunday. You can't do it much more regular than that. I, I guess we could do it every day, several times a day, continually, all day. But there's a point at which you're like, is that necessary? Is it, is it important you know, in, in doing that? Um, you know, should, we, should we celebrate someone's birthday every day of the year? You know, an anniversary every day and so forth. It's, it's, it's meant to be special. And it's meant to have time set aside from it because there's other thing God calls us to do. Calls us to serve our neighbor. I can't hardly serve my neighbor if I'm kneeling at a rail. And uh, so you're right. To do it regularly, it's really for us as church to try to say, how often do I need to be reminded of God's grace? Regularly. Yeah, and, and we kind of determine what that is. But there isn't a prescription in the Bible that says every Sabbath or every other Sabbath or once a month or twice a year. I think there gets to be a point where we just feel that's not right. If somebody said, we're going to do it once a year. Boy, that's, it seems like a pretty great thing that God gives us to do. And only doing it once a year doesn't feel quite right, you know. But doing it every day, several times a day, it doesn't feel as unique and reverent as it should. Other questions about it? Can I go back to baptism? Please, yeah. So when you said that, like, in the Lutheran faith, that, like, if all babies get baptized, but you said that, like, the whoever's up there baptizing them, like, professes that they're going to raise their child in mm -hmm. God's. So what's the difference, like, in a non-denominational church where you have, like, they do... Um, Totally drawn. Like they, what do I want to call it? Um, like a different kind of baptism, a dedication. Yeah. Dedication. Yeah. Thank you. Nothing. Okay. So same thing. Yeah. So if you're not having the symbol of the water. Yeah. Well, the thing is, the thing is about the water. God does command it that way. Okay. Go and be baptized, right? And use water and so forth. So if we're going to call it a baptism from the Bible, it's like using it. Now, how we use the water, um, you know, people submerge and sprinkle and pour. God doesn't tell us and prescribe how. Um, what I think the key is, is that we follow the prescription of what the Bible tells us and we don't deviate from it. Okay. So if, if someone came to me, and I've had this many, many times, Pastor, I'd like to join your church. I come from the Catholic background. I was baptized in the Catholic church. Do I need to be baptized again? No, because the Catholic baptism is the baptism. Water, the words, it's the same thing. I was baptized in a non-denominational church. I was baptized in a Baptist church, so forth. As long as they baptize based on what Scripture says. Now, if they're Mormon, and Mormon is not a Christian denomination, right, um, even though they kind of refer to themselves at it, there is a sort of quasi-baptism, but they don't believe that Jesus and is the Trinity and, and so forth. So a Mormon coming to me saying, do I have to be baptized again? I'm like, you have to be baptized First, because it's not the same thing. So, so a person that has the dedication, there's nothing wrong with the dedication. Again, what saves a person is faith. The baptism delivers it, but so does the proclamation of the gospel. So if, if you, Daniel, weren't baptized and, and just through this class, for example, sharing about grace and, and the love of Jesus, and you're like, I, I want to I wanna follow Jesus with my life. I, I can tell you, if you drop dead, you'd go to heaven. And you're like, but I, I didn't get baptized. That's not what saves us. 
Obedience to what God calls us to do is a constant growth in our life. Going to communion is, is an obedience to that. Not disrespecting those in authority is our obedience to that. We don't follow it all the time. I don't mean to say that in a cavalier way, but to understand that Jesus and faith, the Holy Spirit, faith in Jesus is what saves us. So it's not, it, it, we suddenly make it very legalistic. You've got to do this and do this and do this. And then suddenly we're jumping through hoops to get to heaven. Um, so that's the beautiful thing I think about baptism is that it is so universal because it's so simple. God does the work. We just obediently follow through with what he is. Say this, use this, and trust that. And, and that's it. It, it. Again, it doesn't mean I have a super soaker and a loudspeaker, you know, at the mall. Um, it, it means following what God has given us. But that is, um, in the simplest form, what is true. So we trust that if you're baptized in a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church, or a Nazarene church, it's baptism because God does the work, not was it a Lutheran pastor? Was he... You know, did he do it with his right hand? Did he do it in front of the church? Did he, you know, pour enough water on the head? Pretty soon you're getting just very legalistic instead of God does the work. Let it happen. But, but if you didn't have water, would that mean you want to be baptized with water? Um, I think, I, I believe that God would certainly demonstrate a sense of grace on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you, you know, that would be, crass here you spit on their heads <laughs> I, mean, I, I had a gal uh her name was dolores and she was a 94 year old uh, nurse wasn't still practicing but um she'd worked in world war ii and so forth and she worked in a uh a nicu um as a as a nurse over the years and and she had baptized little tiny infants little preemies when they were born they said you know they're probably not going to live an hour and she had a little Dixie cup, and she just touch her finger in it and, and baptize them right then and there, and then be able to tell the parents and kind of go, no, it, it's okay, I baptized them. And, and they just have that comfort that would come with that because, you know, now that was still water, but it again, it's not the water that makes it work. It's the obedience to saying, I'm, I'm trying to do what God says. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that with the Lord's Supper and saying, hey, all I had was Diet Coke and popcorn, and, and so we'll do the Lord's Supper at this retreat. No, I mean, I think there's a way to honor God still because Lord's Supper is not a, an emergency. I've baptized kids in swimming pools, uh, in rivers and lakes uh, and th bathtubs uh, and things like that in certain circumstances. So again, um, it's, I, I think God determines your, um, uh, your desire, right? To be able to say, I want to try to honor you, God, with this, but it's not a baptismal font in front of a church. We're going to do it in this way, okay? All right, I've taken you guys a little bit beyond that. Um, thank you for tonight. Um, we will dive into lesson three next week. Um, Jared, thanks for the pizzas. Yeah, appreciate that. You guys have a great night, and I will see you soon.